Circulation boiler is a boiler where a pump is used to circulate water inside the boiler. This differs from a natural circulation boiler which relies on current density to circulate water inside the boiler. In some four circulation boilers, the water is circulated 20 times the rate of evaporation. In water tube boilers, the way the water is recirculated inside the boiler before becoming steam can be described as either natural circulation or for circulation. In a water tube boiler, the water is recirculated inside until the vapor pressure of the water overcomes the vapor pressure inside the stream drum and becomes saturated steam. The four circulation boiler begins the same as a natural circulation boiler, at the feed water pump. Water is introduced into the steam drum and is circulated around the boiler, leaving only a steam. What makes the fourth circulation boiler different is its use of a secondary pump that circulates water through the boiler. The secondary pump takes the feed water going to the boiler and raises the pressure of the water going in. In a natural circulation boilers, the circulation of water is dependent on the differential pressures caused by the change of density in the water as it is heated. That is to say that as the water is heated and starts turning to steam, the density decreases sending the hottest water and steam to the top of the furnace tubes. In contrast to the natural circulation boiler, the force circulation boiler uses a water circulation pump to force that flow instead of waiting for the differential to form. Because of this, the generation tubes of the force circulation boiler are able to be oriented in whatever way is required by space constraints. Water is taken from the drum and forced through the steel tubes. In this way it is able to produce steam much faster than that of a natural circulation boiler. Type boiler, type boiler. The water flow path includes an economizer, the boiler drum, downcomers, headers, and the boiler tubes. The water that is supplied to a boiler is called feed water. The first component that the feed water passes through is the economizer. The economizer uses heat from combustion gases that would otherwise flow out of the stack to heat the feed water. Heating the feed water means that less fuel has to be burned in the furnace to convert the water into steam. In this boiler, the heated feed water flows from the economizer and enters the bottom part of the boiler drum through the feed water inlet. The water continually circulates within the boiler through the downcomers, the lower headers, and the boiler tubes. A boiler typically has two or more downcomers and two or more headers. However, for clarity, this illustration shows only one of each. The lower headers supply water to the bottoms of the boiler tubes. The boiler tubes, which line the inside walls of the boiler furnace, are commonly called water walls. The water walls are exposed to the heat produced by burning fuel. As water flows up through the water walls, heat turns some of the water into steam. The mixture of water and steam rises until it enters the boiler drum, where it's separated into water and steam. The steam rises to the top of the drum and the water remains in the bottom. The water is then available to recirculate through the boiler. The flow of water through This is because the water walls are heated by the burning fuel in the boiler furnace. As the mixture of water and steam rises, cooler water from the downcomers flows into the lower headers and then into the water walls. The cooler water is also heated and rises, creating a self-sustaining flow through the water side of the boiler. Natural circulation of water in a boiler is affected by two factors. Ra raising the temperature in the boiler furnace increases natural water circulation because it results in a greater temperature difference between the water walls and the downcomers. Increasing the second factor, pressure, has a negative effect on natural circulation because as pressure increases, the density difference between water and steam decreases. In some boilers, boiler water circulation pumps are used to increase circulation. Circulation that uses pumps is often referred to as controlled circulation. The pumps force the cooler water from the drum through the downcomers, into the lower headers, and up through the water walls. The increase in flow over natural circulation provided by the pumps allows more heat to be absorbed by the water.
As a result, controlled circulation boilers can produce more steam for a given size boiler. A boiler drum has two main functions. I'd cut away view of a typical boiler drum. The bottom part of the drum contains water to be circulated back through the boiler. The top part of the drum is used to collect steam. Heated feed water is fed into the drum through a distribution pipe. The drum is usually kept about half full of water. In this example, the mixture of water and steam that returns to the drum from the water walls is directed against baffles called drum shrouds that run the length of the drum. The shrouds direct the mixture of water and steam into moisture separators, which are located at the top of the shrouds. The moisture separators separate the water from the steam. The water falls into the lower part of the drum, where it mixes with the feed water. The steam rises into the upper part of the drum. The steam could still have some water mixed in with it, so in this example, it is sent through dryers, which are located in the top of the drum. The dryers remove as much water as possible before the steam leaves the drum. This is important because water that flows out of the drum with the steam could damage downstream components. The steam is discharged from the drum through steam outlet pipes. Between the time that steam leaves the boiler drum and the time that it enters the condenser, it is acted on by components in the steam flow path. To understand what these components do, you need a working knowledge of three basic concepts that are associated with the production and use of steam. They are boiling, saturation temperature, and superheat. Boiling is also increases. For example, at sea level, atmospheric pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch. At that pressure, the saturation temperature of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. At a pressure of 1,000 pounds per square inch, the saturation temperature of water rises to 545 degrees Fahrenheit. When boiling occurs, as in this water wall, both water and steam are present and at saturation temperature. No matter how much heat is added to the boiler furnace, the temperature in the water walls will never rise above the saturation temperature as long as water is present. However, after all of the water has been removed from the steam, the temperature of the steam can be raised above the saturation temperature. Steam that is which remove water from the steam and thus prepare the steam for superheating. Once the water is removed, the steam is sent to separate sets of boiler tubes called superheaters, where it is heated above its saturation temperature. The superheaters are positioned so that they are exposed to heat from combustion in the boiler furnace or from hot combustion gases. The superheater tubes absorb the heat and transfer it to the steam passing through them. There are several primary superheater is a superheater that the steam passes through first. It's usually a convection superheater, and it's generally in a cooler location than the secondary superheater. The primary superheater is designed to raise the temperature of steam from its saturation temperature to a specific temperature range. The secondary superheater raises the temperature of the steam again. The secondary superheater is usually located closer to the boiler furnace so that it's exposed to higher temperatures. The secondary superheater may be either a convection superheater or, as in this case, a radiant superheater. This boiler has an attemperator or desuperheater, located between the primary and secondary superheaters. The desuperheater keeps the steam from becoming so hot that it damages the superheater tubes. If the steam gets too hot, the desuperheater sprays water into the steam flow. This water immediately flashes to steam and mixes with the steam that's already there. The result is a decrease in the temperature of the superheated steam. From the secondary superheater, the steam goes to the high pressure or HP section of the turbine. As the steam flows through the HP section, it gives up a lot of its energy and its temperature and pressure drop. Before it moves on to the other sections of the turbine, the steam returns to the boiler where its temperature is increased as it flows through one or more reheaters. Reheaters are very similar to superheaters. They use heat from the boiler furnace or from hot combustion gases to raise the temperature of the steam. For example, this boiler has a primary reheater that the steam enters first as it comes from the high pressure section of the turbine. After the steam flows through the primary reheater, it moves on to a secondary reheater. 
and a temperator located at the beginning of the secondary reheater is used to control the final temperature of the superheated steam leaving the secondary reheater. The attemperator sprays water into the steam flow if the steam gets too hot. The secondary reheater in this example can also be classified as a radiant reheater because it's located in a line of sight with the boiler flames and receives most of its heat by radiation from the flames. The primary reheater is located farther from the flame and it receives most of its heat by convection from the hot combustion gases, so it can be classified as a convection reheater. After it's reheated, the steam in this steam flow path flows to the intermediate pressure or IP section of the turbine and then through the low pressure or LP section. From the low pressure section, the spent steam flows into the condenser. Inside the condenser, the steam flows over tubes that contain cooling water. The water in the tubes absorbs heat from the steam and the steam condenses back into water. The water is collected in the bottom of the condenser and pumped back to the boiler to begin the cycle again. The primary reheater is located farther from the flame and it receives most of its heat by convection from the hot combustion gases, so it can be classified as a convection reheater. At any given pressure, there is a corresponding temperature at which water will boil. This temperature is called the saturation temperature. For example, at standard atmospheric pressure, which is 14.7 psi, the saturation temperature of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. When pressure increases, as it does in this boiler, the saturation temperature also increases. At 1,000 psi, the saturation temperature of water is 545 degrees Fahrenheit. When the saturation temperatures for water at different pressures are plotted on a temperature versus pressure chart, a line is formed showing the relationship between saturation temperature and pressure. However, this relationship between temperature and pressure only holds true up to a certain point. That point, which is called the critical point, is 705 degrees Fahrenheit and 3206 psi. At or above the critical point, the densities of water and steam are the same. In other words, there is no distinguishable difference between water and steam. When a boiler's conditions, in a typical supercritical once through boiler, boiler feed pumps force the feed water through a header at the bottom of the furnace and up through the water walls. As the water flows through the water walls, its temperature increases. The water in the water walls is already under a very high pressure, typically around 3500 psi. That's well above critical point pressure. When the temperature rises above the critical point temperature, water becomes indistinguishable from steam. The section of the water walls where this happens is called the transition zone. There is no need for a drum, moisture separators, dryers, or a recirculation system because once the flow is passed through the transition zone, there is no water left to recirculate. The steam that leaves the transition zone moves on to the components in the boiler steam flow path. The components in the steam flow path are generally the same for supercritical boilers and subcritical boilers. The main advantage of a supercritical once through boiler is that it operates more efficiently than a subcritical boiler that has to recirculate water in the process of producing steam. A supercritical once through boiler requires less fuel than a drum type boiler of the same size to produce the same amount of steam. That makes a supercritical boiler less expensive to operate. However,